right, hello everyone. I'm Melissa Green, a Technology Accessibility Training Specialist with the Faculty Resource Center's Emerging Technology and Accessibility Team. Our team works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with the university's websites and the technologies we use for teaching, learning, and administrative functions. And you can find more information about what we do on our website, which is accessibility.ua.edu. I just pasted a link to that in the chat. Sorry, just one second. Got some folks struggling to get audio. So let me see if I can take a moment to help them get set up. Still here, be right with you. Okay, we use social media to share information and engage with our audiences. However, by failing to ensure our social media content is accessible to users with disabilities, we erect barriers to engagement and can undermine the success of those efforts. Uh, today's session will cover social media accessibility, why it matters, uh, common accessibility challenges and solutions, and what you need to know to ensure your messages reach the largest possible audience across social media platforms and when using specific sites and apps. Uh, a quick moment for housekeeping. This slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off, but I thought you might like to see who you're speaking with today. To improve audio quality, I have muted everyone by default, but when you want to talk, uh, just select the microphone icon in the Zoom control bar to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off, but please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, when I'm talking or sharing my screen, please write in the chat box and let me know if you can't see or hear something. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat box throughout. I may not be watching closely while I'm talking, but I'll do my best to check in every once in a while. And if I don't see your question or comment immediately, um, I will come back to it at the end. This session is being recorded, and I'll send you a link to that recording via email in the next few days, along with links to resources shared during the session. A recent survey by the Pew Research Center found that some 88% of 18 to 29 year olds indicate that they use a form of social media. 78% of those ages 30 to 49, 64% of those ages 50 to 64, and 37% of Americans 65 and older reported using at least one social media site. Um, like the general population as a whole, people with disabilities use social media to connect with one another, engage with news content, share information, and entertain themselves. Uh, for some people with dis disabilities, social media can also be a lifeline, uh, a way to connect with information and assistance, a bridge to community, a path to employment, and a way to tackle isolation. Uh, for these reasons and to meet our legal requirements as a public university, it's important to ensure that the social media content we create is accessible to users with disabilities. And as an added bonus, the steps we take to make our content more accessible also make it more discoverable and usable by people of all abilities. 
Many strategies for developing accessible social media content can be applied across social media platforms. And we're going to start by talking about those before addressing specific tools like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. For example, providing your contact information. If the platform enables you to do so, list a primary phone number and email address where someone can reach you. Looking at an example here, uh, this is the Facebook page for the Birmingham Education Foundation. Um, this is specifically the About section of the BEF's profile or the uh, contact information of their About section. Uh, the Birmingham Education Foundation has listed a phone number, uh, a website, and an email address. And a lot of uh, tools will, will give you sort of a bio or a profile or a specific section to do that. You wanna take advantage of that so that your users um, can get in touch with you easily. The Smithsonian Institution's Twitter profile includes a link uh, to their homepage within their Twitter bio. That's where I'm uh, hovering my mouse cursor right now. So in the field provided for a link, they've included their homepage URL as i.edu, but in their bio, they've got some additional links. Uh, the legal, which every time I come back to this page as an example, that's always present. And then um, some other information that um, seems to be related to the current programming they're offering. So whether you're using a designated field for an email address, phone number, or website address, or including that information in your bio, um, have a way for your users to get in touch with you if they're unable to access or interact with your content. Another general accessibility principle that applies across platforms is communicating clearly and concisely. You can enhance the accessibility of your social media content uh, by writing in plain language. Writing in plain language is a way to ensure that people can understand and use the information provided by a social media post. Uh, key best practices for writing in plain language include choosing words that are common and easy to understand, using clear short sentences and paragraphs, and writing in the active voice instead of the passive voice. Think about that journalistic style of writing um, that we all learned, who, what, when, where, why. Uh, starting with the most important information first, and then following with additional information or details. Uh, doing so as well as following those other plain language writing tips will help you communicate more clearly and concisely. Your content is more likely to be accessible if it's conveyed in multiple ways. So don't just use images, color, video, or audio. Um, don't just use text. Use a combination of those approaches. Share important information across all of your social media channels, modifying the content and its presentation so it's appropriate to the platform and its audience. Uh, for example, the hashtags that you would include with an Instagram post may not make sense on Facebook, and they may create visual clutter and be confusing. Uh, another example, if you post an image of text on Snapchat, let's say a graphic promoting an event, you might also post a link to a relevant web page or events calendar entry. Another general tip is to use color thoughtfully. When working with color, you must make sure that color isn't your only method of conveying important information. So for example, losing dues, listing dues in green and don'ts in red. That's a no-no. Um, this is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, sometimes called color blindness, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning. By using more than just color to convey information, you're providing multiple means of representation. Those of you who have been in workshops or webinars with me before have probably seen this image before. I use it when talking about color contrast in documents and web content, but I actually created it um, with social media in mind. This is a, a common type of image that I happen to see on social media, an image of text 
um, with an inspirational quote or saying with a photograph or, or other image background. The example on this slide is an image of text on a gray cloudy background. The text reads, be someone sunshine when their skies are gray. Uh, both the foreground text and the background are shades of gray, except for the word sunshine, which is yellow. And this combination is difficult for many of us to read, but it's especially challenging for users with low vision and users in bright sunlight. There are several tools you can use to check for sufficient contrast. Uh, one of my favorites is the WebAIM Color Contrast Checker which lets you check to see if your color choices meet the contrast ratios specified by the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. Uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are the set of guidelines adopted by the university's Web Resources Accessibility Policy. Um, but they also provide just general benchmarking for accessibility across all environments. So even if it's not web content, even if it's just a graphic I'm creating for print or a digital sign or a print flyer, um, I try to follow the WCAG guidelines for color contrast because it means my content will be more accessible and readable. So the way this tool works is that you uh, supply the hexadecimal codes for the background and foreground colors. And if your color combination fails to pass the test, if it fails to have sufficient contrast, you can adjust the lightness slider to modify the colors by slight degrees until you get a passing result that has sufficient contrast. So this, these are the color, this slide includes a screenshot of the WebAIM color contrast checker. It, is uh, checking the contrast of the colors of gray I used in the image on the previous slide. They do not meet sufficient contrast. Um, if I was actually designing this image, what I would do to fix it is to make the foreground color darker or make the background color lighter or maybe a combination of the two until I got a passing result from the checker and then utilize that color combination. Another tool our team likes is the Pasiello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer, which works on the web and with documents and images on your computer. You can enter color codes to check or use an eyedropper tool to select colors to check. Uh, both of these are free, um, and I'll include links to them in the follow-up email with the recording. There's also a pretty low-tech way to see if your color contrast is sufficient, and that's to print or recolor the the image in question and grayscale. And when I originally developed this image, it was the gray text on the gray background that I thought would be most problematic. But when recoloring that image in grayscale, um, you can really see that the, the yellow on gray has pretty poor contrast as well. And again, this is most impactful for people with visual disabilities, um, but also makes a difference in bright sunlight, in the back of a large lecture hall, in a meeting room with an older projector, um, in a room where there's lots of glare on the screen, having sufficient contrast is really gonna benefit everyone. Another accessibility principle that applies across sites and apps is captioning or providing transcripts for media. Captions are text that appear on a video to match its soundtrack including dialogue and nonverbal sounds like thunder or dog barking. The screenshot on the left side of the slide shows a captioned video playing in the YouTube player. And here, captions appear in white text on a black background in the lower third of the video above the player controls. A transcript is a written record of a video or audio recording. It may or may not include descriptions of filler sounds like um or uh. An example of an NPR interview transcript is shown on the right side of the slide. As speakers are identified by their names and titles with their words transcribed um, exactly as the speaker says them. Captions can be built from a transcript by breaking the text up into small segments called caption frames and synchronizing them with the media so that each caption frame can be displayed at the right time. Uh, we're here to help. We can provide guidance on how to use the captioning and transcribing features in most players 
platforms and lecture capture systems. Our area, the technology accessibility team, also administers grants to professionally caption or transcribe UA-owned video and audio that will be shared on public or campus-wide websites, and that includes social media. So if you're producing or sharing audio um, or video that is owned by UA, so it's not purchased from a commercial publisher, and you're sharing that publicly on your social media, um, we can help you get that caption through our captioning grant. We work with a vendor called Rev, um, and the way the grant works is we'll set you up with a Rev.com account, you submit your files for captioning or transcribing, you charge uh, the cost of that to our P card, which is the most fun part, I think, and uh, you're provided with the transcript or caption file to then upload to wherever you're sharing the video or audio content. So if you're not connected with that, um, reach out to us. You can send us an email at accessibility at ua.edu and we'll ha be happy to um, help you start utilizing the captioning grant. Depending on the nature of the video you share via social media, it may also need audio descriptions. Um, audio descriptions are, use, are beneficial for users with visual disabilities. A standard audio description narrates the visual parts of the video and is played in between the video's dialogue and other essential sounds. I'm going to share a brief example of a video with audio description. This is a trailer for the movie Frozen. Don't worry, no singing. Um, <laughs> and the audio description is supplied by a female presenting voice with what I believe is a British accent. So that voice is the voice providing the audio description. Let's take a look. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed coal-eyed snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh. Hello! <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. <sighs> His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him, though actually he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. All right, hate to stop us here. I'll send you a link to the full version if you want to continue watching on your own. Um, so if we had a little more time, I would actually play the version of that trailer without the audio description, ask you to listen to it with your eyes closed and try to guess what's going on in the video. Um, really the only sound that we're getting is um, laughing. Um, there's a sneeze at some point, hoofs scraping on ice. You know, if you hadn't seen that trailer before and the audio description wasn't there, you'd really have no idea what was being conveyed visually. So that audio description, again, is just vital um, for someone who doesn't have full use of their vision. You may be wondering when it's necessary to provide audio descriptions. You know, is it necessary to include these in the videos that you produce? Um, if video is produced with accessibility in mind, then audio descriptions are often unnecessary, as long as the visual elements within the video are described in the audio. Um, and I'll give an example of this. I don't produce a lot of video, but when I do produce video, it's usually a screencast tutorial. So a screencast tutorial, you're sharing what's on your screen while describing um, what's, what's being shown. And because the audio by default kind of already describes what's being shown, it's not necessary to include additional audio description. Um, if you have any questions about whether or not it's necessary to provide audio description for a particular video, feel free to share that with us and we'll be happy to weigh in. Another general tip, you'll also want to pay attention to the links you share. Um, you can avoid sharing lengthy URLs that are difficult to read by using a link shortener. Some social media platforms, such as Twitter, offer link shortening functionality built in, or you can connect a third-party tool, like Bitly, um, to your account. 
When using link shorteners in particular, it can be helpful to indicate what sort of content you're linking to. Um, is it a video? Is it a web page, a sign up form, an article? Um, you'll want to share that information um, when you share the link and not just post a link without any sort of explanation. And of course, you'll want to make sure any content you're linking to is also accessible. Finally, check out the help documentation of the sites and apps you use to learn more about their accessibility. Um, all of the specific tools we're about to discuss provide information about accessibility settings and features. I'll send you links to those pages. So the best practices we just discussed apply across platforms and to other areas of digital content creation, but each social media site also has its own unique accessibility features and challenges. Uh, let's address a few of those now, starting with Facebook. A couple of years ago, Facebook added an automatic alternative text feature that uses object recognition technology to create descriptions of photos. To use it, users open Facebook with a screen reader and focus on an image. If objects are identified, they may hear a list of items in the photo, um, a list of items the photo may contain, or a description written by the person who uploaded the photo. Uh, we're going to watch a quick video demonstrating this feature. updated her cover photo yesterday at 10 29 p.m. This image may contain outdoor, cloud, foliage, flat, tree. This image may contain six people, child, close up, like one or more people, jewelry, smiling, 19 likes, three comments Aww. like. And now I can see the picture in my head. Like, yeah, you shouldn't have been that close up. <laughs> like, now I can say it. Oh, I gotta love it. You have no idea. This is amazing. That whole saying of pictures being worth a thousand words, I, I think it's true. But unless you have somebody to describe it to you, even having like three words just helps flesh out all the details that I can't see. That makes me feel like included and like I'm a part of it too. I can just call my mom like, yay, I, I seen your picture. And she'll be like, what? She was like, how you see it? Because my phone read it to me. It's new. <laughs> I seen it. <laughs> I feel like I can fit in. There's more I can do. And I'm going to mess with my mother head so much. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> automatic alternative text feature that Facebook launched a couple of years ago. Um, it's also possible to provide alternative text describing an image and we're going to take a look at how to do that now. So this is the technology accessibility team's Facebook page and I'm going to show how you can replace the automatically supplied text to provide a better description of an image. Right now, this can only be done on a computer, or at least the last time I checked, this can only be done on a computer. It wasn't a function available through the Facebook mobile apps. So first, to see and edit alt text for a photo before you post it. Uh, the process begins in a similar manner to how you would typically share a photo or video on Facebook. So I'm gonna share a photo, a selected photo, like photo video, I'm choosing upload photo slash video and navigating to the photo I wish to share. An image of Big Al. 
So if I hover my mouse over the image I'm about to share, I get a couple of options, tag products and edit photo. I'm selecting edit photo. And in addition to being able to change the visual appearance of the photo by cropping it or applying filters, I can also supply alternative text. So I'm selecting alt text from the left sidebar. And we can see the automatically generated alternative text for this photo is one or more people and outdoor. Well, that's somewhat useful. It would give uh, the viewer an idea um, of what's happening, but really this image is a little more specific than that. So if I wanted to provide a better description, I would select override generated alt text and then type a brief description, uh, something like, University of Alabama mascot Big Al on the field at Bryant-Denny, um, depending on the context. So that's the process for supplying alt text at the time that you post a photo. I'm gonna cancel out of this and briefly look at how you edit alt text for a photo that you've already published. So I'm navigating to my photos, just selecting one of the photos on our timeline. So you would select the photo for which you want to supply alternative text and then choose edit. Actually, sorry, the alt text for a previously posted image is in options and then change alt text. And again, the automatically generated alt text for the photo will appear. In this case, it just said text. Uh, for whatever reason, Facebook's object recognition technology is not very good at um, identifying what the text in an image is. It, it will usually just say text. Um, so here we would add alternative text that describes the contents of the photo for people with visual disabilities. And uh, we did this at the time that we posted the image. So that's a couple different ways that you can make the images you share on Facebook more accessible. Generally speaking, if you're sharing an image of text, um, for example, one thing that we'll do a lot is develop an image as a digital sign and then repurpose that image on our social media. Uh, generally speaking, the best pra practice is to reproduce that text in the alternative text. So if there's text on an image, that's the text you would want to use in the alternative text. Another thing that you can do to make your Facebook content more accessible is to caption your video content. And there's a few different ways to add captions to a video on Facebook. You can upload a caption file, such as the one you'd receive from our captioning grant provider. You can also write captions or auto-generate them. Um, however, I'll caution you against relying on the auto-generate option on Facebook or anywhere else, YouTube, Vimeo, and so on. Um, automatic captions only average 60 to 70% accuracy and are therefore not considered accessible. Uh, can you use the automatic captions as a starting point? Absolutely, it's a good one, uh, provided you review them and edit or remove any parts that haven't been properly transcribed, but you can't rely on those automatic captions alone. So we're gonna walk through the process of adding captions to a video. So I'm going to uh, return to home base for the Technology Accessibility Team Facebook, select photo video to upload a video, select photo video, select upload photos video. The video I'm going to upload is titled 10 Ways to Make the University of Alabama More Accessible. We're really proud of it. It was created for us by an honors college class. I'm selecting that video now. After selecting the video and providing a title and other description in the right sidebar, you can select subtitles and captions. Here you would specify the primary language spoken in the video, which in our case is English. I'm gonna select that here. And then here are the options for adding captions to the video. The choices are auto-generate, write, or upload. 
So if you already have a caption file, such as one that you've received from our captioning vendor, you'll want to select Upload, navigate to that caption file, and those captions will then be uploaded. Um, we need to set a default language. Most users specify a preferred language for captions, um, but if they haven't, the default language will be used instead. So after doing that, we could then select Next, uh, continue through the regular video uploading process, and then publish that captioned video on Facebook. You'd follow a similar process to add captions to an existing video on your page. Um, you can find that page, find that post on your page's timeline, uh, select edit post, and then follow the steps above. Uh, people who watch your page's video with sound turned off will automatically see captions. Uh, people who watch your video with the sound turned on will need to turn on captions to see them. And the language people see captions in is determined by their preferred language. So this is another example of where accessibility is necessary for some, but beneficial for everyone. You know, the captions are necessary for a person who's deaf or hard of hearing to access your video, but are also going to benefit someone who's watching your video with the sound off. Um, and that's quite a few folks for whatever reason. They're in a quiet environment. They're in a loud environment. Um, by providing those captions, you're increasing the reach of your content. Final suggestion that's specific to Facebook. Let me get out of this. Exit. One suggestion specific to Facebook is just to keep up to date with Facebook accessibility. Facebook helps information um, about accessibility for people with disabilities is a good place for that. Uh, Facebook accessibility team also has their own Facebook page um, that they regularly provide information about accessibility features and developments on. So that's a good place to keep up with that as well. And I'll send links to both of those in the follow-up email. Let's talk about Twitter. Twitter is a popular place to post photos and other graphics. Uh, fortunately, it has a feature that makes it simple to add descriptions to these images that can be read by assistive technologies such as screen readers. The first step to using this feature is to turn it on in the Twitter account. So I am um, navigating to the Technology Accessibility Team, Twitter account. I'm going to access our account settings. While in the account settings, I'm selecting accessibility in the left sidebar to access the accessibility settings. And you'll notice here that image descriptions, compose image descriptions is enabled. Um, once you've enabled this, Twitter will add the ability to describe images to supply alternative text for images at the time that you post them. So from then on, when posting an image, Twitter will provide this option at the bottom of the image. Um, so let's take a look at this. So um, we're at home base on twitter.com. I'm selecting the option to add a photo. I'm choosing my Big Al photo. And because I've enabled the ability to add description, I now have the space and a prompt to do so. And here's where I describe the image. Uh, UA mascot, Big Al, on the field at Bryant-Denny. Um, at last I checked, you have the ability to provide these descriptions from multiple places. So you can provide the descriptions from the iOS Twitter app or the Android Twitter app or from TweetDeck or Twitter.com, but it had to be enabled in the first place on actual Twitter.com. So if you um, go to your Twitter settings, turn that on, um, you should then have the ability to provide those descriptions when using official Twitter apps. I haven't noticed it yet in third-party tools such as Hootsuite. Describing your images helps enhance their accessibility. Another thing that you can do when using Twitter is to use accessible hashtags. 
Um, this slide includes the hashtag Roll Tide formatted in two different ways. One in which all of the letters are lowercase and one in which the words Roll and Tide are capitalized. For screen readers and similar tools, this is a pretty important distinction. If each word is capitalized, the screen reader will recognize and read it as an individual word within the hashtag. But if it's not capitalized, it may run together with the other words in a way that makes the hashtag very difficult to understand. So if your hashtags include compound words or phrases, write them so each word or phrase begins with a capital letter. Uh, this practice is known as camel case, and it means the difference between roll tide and roll tide. This next consideration also has to do with how screen readers voice Twitter content. Uh, most screen readers can read descriptions of emoji, but including them in your social media account display names can be d confusing. We're going to take a look at a brief video demo of this. This is a video from technology accessibility professional Nicholas Steenhout. Um, so his Twitter display name is usually his first and last name, Nicholas Steenhout. He modified it by adding several emoji to it a wheelchair symbol, a raised fist, uh, a Canadian flag, and so on. He then used VoiceOver, the screen reading tool built into the Mac OS and iOS operating systems to read his display name. So here's what it sounded like um, when he used a screen reader to read aloud a display name that had a bunch of emoji in it. Emoji, wheelchair symbol emoji, raised fist emoji, Party Popper Nicholas emoji, flag of Canada emoji, smiling face with smiling eyes seen out at Valroom, link. So the screen reader read the emoji aloud, but again, in the context of a display name, that ended up being somewhat cluttered and confusing. So um, I see this more with personal accounts than business or organizational accounts, but it can be kind of trendy to uh, adjust the emoji in one's display name sort of seasonally. Um, it's just something that you'll probably want to avoid on any official Twitter account. I see a question in the chat um, from Diane. How far back should we correct alternative text for Facebook photos to be in compliance? Or do we begin now going forward? So that, that's a great question. So the university's web resources accessibility policy uh, was put into place in November 2018. Our team will be starting compliance reviews starting this November, November 2019. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to ensure that all of your content is accessible from the time at which the policy was put into place. So I would start with content that uh, moving forward, always easiest and most important to make sure that any new content is accessible. And if you have the time or resources to do so, maybe work backwards to November 2018. The policy, um, which can be found at policies.ua.edu. Let me see if I can grab a link to it really quick to share in the chat. The policy actually addresses the accessibility of legacy content uh, differently than the accessibility of new content. So um, there's some flexibility built there. You know, you've correctly identified that what's most important is to create accessibly moving forward rather than devoting too much time or resources to work on accessibility moving backward. So I hope that addresses that question. If it doesn't, feel free to reach out to us, share any content you're concerned about, and we'll be happy to weigh in. Our next platform that we're going to talk about is uh, Instagram. So Instagram, mobile photo, video sharing service where users take images or videos, apply digital filters, and have the ability to share them on the application itself and on a wide variety of social networking services. And yes, blind people do use Instagram. I'm going to show a little bit of a video in which Tommy Edison, who has been blind since birth, demonstrates how to use Instagram on the iPhone. 
Um, he uses it with the accessibility settings on his phone that allow him to navigate the touch screen and some applications. So today I'm going to show you how Instagram works. You may be saying, a blind guy using Instagram? Watch. The interesting thing about doing Instagram for me is that I get to take pictures of the world as it sort of goes by, or of places that I go, you know, or little pictures of work or whatever, and it's a sort of fun for me. I've never had a camera before. And yes, just like the iPhone, Instagram is accessible too. Instagram. So what that means is that the iPhone will talk to me as I move my finger around the screen and tell me where I am. Tab bar home. Tab bar popular. Tab bar camera. So let's just get the camera up. Tab bar camera. Button. And look, now on the bottom. Take photo. Button. That's what it will do. So we'll just take a picture of the crew. Why am I holding the phone up to my face like I can look through the thing is beyond it? But here we go. And there's our picture. So I can just run my finger across the bottom of the phone and it'll tell me what filters I have to choose from. Apply filter tomorrow. Button. Apply filter rise. Button. So we'll select filters pro 2. Apply filters pro 2. Let's accept our picture. Uh, accept photo. Button. And now we have to put a caption on it. Caption. So now we'll just tell Siri what to write. Dictate. Here's a picture of the crew, comma, as we shoot the Instagram video, period. And now we have to choose all the different sharing options. Toggle Twitter sharing. Toggle Facebook sharing. Toggle Flickr sharing, toggle Tumblr sharing, switch button, off, on, done. And here's our Instagram, look. Here's a picture of the crew as we shoot the Instagram video, Bibland Film Critic, image. I've been getting some interesting comments about these too, you know, somebody told me that one was just a, an orange smudge. <laughs> so I took a nature shot one time and somebody said I couldn't screw up nature. I took one of myself and it was a shot up my left nostril, so it was great. So in the follow-up email, I'll share um, an additional video from Tommy in which he uses the technology accessibility features on his phone to access, access comments on Instagram. Um, it's interesting because that sort of illustrates one of the challenges around emoji. So uh, he is reading the comments on his Instagram post. Folks who had used the built-in emoji on their keyboards, his screen reader read those correctly. Um, but a couple folks typed emoticons using the keyboard um, and the screen reader wasn't quite sure what to do with that and it was confusing for him. So um, just an interesting sort of perspective on, on how a small choice like that can make a big difference when it comes to accessibility. Like Facebook, uh, Instagram recently introduce the ability to add alternative text to photos. Um, Instagram also has an automatic alternative text feature that uses object recognition to automatically create descriptions of photos. But you can replace this text to provide a better description. Um, and keep in mind that this description will only be read if someone is using a screen reader to access Instagram. Um, to see and edit alt text for a photo before you post on Instagram, you would start by taking a photo or uploading an existing photo to Instagram, choose a filter and edit the image, and then choose next, tap advanced settings at the bottom of the screen, tap add alt text or write alt text, and then write your alt text in the box and select done or save, depending on whether you're using iOS or Android. And there's an example of those steps uh, depicted on this slide. Someone's posted an outdoor photograph, uh, the text that visual users will see and screen reader users were here that accompanies the photograph is spent the day exploring but a, a user with a visual disability using a screen reader will also hear a description of the image, um, which has been described as a hiking trail lined with sunflowers on a beautiful day. You can also change the alt text of a photo after you've already posted it on Instagram by selecting the option to edit the photo, and I'll make sure you get steps to that in the follow-up email. Like on Twitter, um, when using Instagram, it's important to use camel case hashtags where each word in the hashtag is capitalized. And again, that's to help ensure the hashtag's words are re read clearly by screen readers. Um, 
how, camel case hashtags can be easier to read for everyone. It can be difficult for visual users to distinguish between multiple words and a hashtag. So by capitalizing the first letter, you're helping them as well. Snapchat, um, not being used super widely um, in an official capacity at the university, um, but it is being used a little bit. It's another social media platform that's very focused on multimedia content. Um, which can make it more difficult to ensure that messages are accessible. Following those general accessibility best practices we started with is particularly important when it comes to Snapchat, which really has nothing else to offer accessibility-wise than the other sites and apps we've looked at. Uh, with Snapchat in particular, less is more. Um, Snapchat offers the option to add many different types of animations, edits, and captions to photos and videos, but including too many may make posts confusing or unreadable for those with visual impairments or cognitive disabilities. So to improve accessibility, you want to limit the type and number of features added to your snaps. You should especially avoid any kind of strobing, flickering, or flashing effects, which can be problematic for people with some forms of epilepsy, a vestibular disorder, or migraines. And share your Snapchat content on other platforms. Uh, Snapchat content can be saved to the memory section of the app and then exported, which offers the option to reshare this content on another platform that has better accessibility features. And this is also a good option just to keep records of the content shared on Snapchat. Many university departments, programs, and areas have YouTube channels. Uh, though there are many other video sharing sites, YouTube remains dominant in this area, and fortunately, it also offers ways to improve the accessibility of videos, even if those videos are also shared on other platforms. YouTube offers multiple options for creating captions for video content, including automatically generated captions. And as I said before, though these automatic captions are a helpful feature, they often have numerous errors. So don't plan to rely solely on these captions. Now switch over to our, um, the technology accessibility teams, YouTube channel to take a look at how to add captions to a YouTube video. So you'll want to sign in to uh, Creator Studio or YouTube Studio. In the left sidebar, select Videos. You'll then click on the thumbnail of or title of the video that you wish to edit. I'm selecting our 10 ways video. Captioning options are available under the Advanced tab. If you have a caption file, such as the SRT file we previously added to this video on Facebook, you can then select Upload Subtitles slash Closed Captions. Choose between with timing or without timing. So a caption file, an SRT or other caption specific file has timing. It has time codes assigned to snippets of text. If you only had a transcript um, that didn't have timing, perhaps a, a script that you use when recording the video, you would select without timing. So I'm selecting with timing because I have an actual caption file and choosing continue. Here I would navigate to that caption file and select it. And that set of English language captions are then uploaded to YouTube. So I'm going to not save that just so I can use this again as an example. It's also possible for you to uh, edit those automatically generated captions. This is another video, just a 41 second video um, that I uploaded. I'm going to select the title or the thumbnail in order to edit it. Go to the Advanced tab to access those captioning options. So 
right now I haven't uploaded English language captions. What I have are the automatically generated English captions. YouTube is going to do this automatically. I didn't have to do anything to make YouTube generate those. But if I want to check them for accuracy and edit them, I would select the three dots next to English by YouTube automatic. Choose edit. Currently it reads edit on classic studio because they're switching between two versions of YouTube studio. And here I could review uh, those captions and edit them. So automatic captions, good start. Be sure to follow this process to review and edit them or take advantage of our captioning grant to obtain an actual SRT file with time codes that you can use. In addition to making your videos accessible, there are additional benefits to hosting captioned video on YouTube. Uh, closed captions open up your YouTube content to a larger audience. There are many YouTube users that, um, for whatever reason, um, hearing impairment, deaf, learning preference, language preference, are going to be searching specifically for caption videos. So I'm going to demonstrate how that search works by searching for one of my favorite things. Um, it's funny, you can see some of my previous searches here. I'm searching for Danskos, which are some shoes that I really like. Choosing the filter option and limiting the results to just those videos with subtitles or closed captions. And so now only the videos for which closed captions are available appear. So if you uh, provide those closed captions, again, you're going to ensure that users who are looking specifically for that are going to be able to find them. Captions also open up your YouTube content to those who speak languages besides the ones spoken in your video. So I'm going to select um, one of Hey everyone, videos. what's going on? My name is Autumn. And um, my primary language is English, which is the primary language in the video, but if I wanted to, I could go to the settings. Go to subtitles, close captions, and choose auto translate. And then choose a different language to have those captions translated into. I'll choose French. So it is automatically generated. Um, a native speaker would probably say that it's not perfect. But again, by utilizing captions, by providing uh, edited, accurate captions, you're opening up this content to a whole bunch more users than you would if you just uploaded the video without any captioning in place. Captions are also beneficial for viewers in quiet offices or other spaces where audio use is discouraged. Uh, people in loud environments in which it's difficult to hear or understand and people who learn better when they're able to read along while hearing the words spoken aloud. Um, if you share a video with no sound or only background music, be sure to indicate this in the captions. You might also indicate it in the metadata for the video. So in YouTube, that would probably, the best place for that would probably be the description. So that users know they're not missing the audio part of the viewing experience. Um, and if you're creating a video that has a lot of visual content that's not reflected in the audio, consider creating audio descriptions. Um, though YouTube does not have a built-in tool for creating these, they can be added to a video with other tools before uploading to YouTube to ensure that the video is accessible to the broadest possible audience. So in closing, everyone in the UA community has some responsibility when it comes to creating accessible content. Um, I hope that the information you've learned today is helpful and that it, along with the resources you'll be provided in the follow-up email, will help you create accessibly. I'm going to stop here. I hope you found this useful and you won't hesitate to reach out to us if we can help you as you put what you learned into practice. You can contact our team by visiting accessibility at accessibility.ua.edu. Um, or emailing accessibility at ua.edu. Um, you can also reach out to me directly um, at mfgreen1 at ua.edu. That's all I have. Um, at this point, I'll open things up for anyone who might have questions or thoughts to share. Feel free to do that in the chat or by enabling your audio in your Zoom controls. 
I do have a question um, that was sent to me directly in the chat about camel case. Um, what about web addresses? Um, when sharing a web address, should one utilize camel case? Um, so to me, that's really gonna depend across platforms. For example, a uh, Facebook post. If you're sharing a Facebook, a link to your website on Facebook, um, the URL is going to appear as you pasted it. Um, if you are sharing a link on Twitter, you're probably using a link shortening service, so the user would not see the URL. Um, you know, that's a good question. I really hadn't thought about that before. I'll, I'll have to, to think more on that in terms of visual design, like a digital sign um, or an Instagram or Snapchat image. Should the, should the URL be presented in camel case? I'll see if I can find some more information from screen reader users to see if that makes a difference. Any other questions or thoughts to share in the chat or over the mic? All right, well, I'm not seeing anything else coming in. Um, thank you all for your time this morning. I hope you found this useful. Um, I'll be in touch with you soon with follow-up resources and a link to a webinar recording, and I hope you all have a great day.